So thank you for joining us today for uh, this seminar with Dr. Sara Ayyubi. Uh, Dr. Sara has a master's degree in computer uh, in mathematics and computer science from Lebanese American University, and she recently graduated as a PhD in information and systems from Concordia. Um, she is uh, one of the executive and the sec secretary for the Montreal OR student chapter, and she will be pursuing her postdoctoral fellowship in uh, Walton University for 2016. So good luck, Sara, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Leah. Um, thank you all for attending the seminar. Um, the word that I'll present today is the last work I've done during my PhD studies here at California, um, and it's entitled A Cut and Solve Based Approach for the Rich Country Project. It's quite long, but it's always been what it's about. So, um, for introduction, I'll talk about why it's about computing. Then, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of denial of computer science, I'll talk about the impact of rich education on how we as an internet. And then I'll introduce the role of the robots in the Italian infrastructure. Once we're done with that, we won't create the problem by looking at the trade up between hardware and software um, uh, based on the boxes. And then we'll introduce the group of the first function assigned to problems and how we solve that problem using the hardware solve based approach. Um, then we'll look at the American ones and then the So, um, cloud computing, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, um, cloud computing enables the, uh, the use of computing as a utility. Uh, currently, we're very confined with the capacity of our hardware. When you buy a laptop, you get as many memory as that laptop offers and as many processing capacity as that laptop offers. What cloud computing is hoping to do is to turn computing into a utility very much like water or electricity. You turn on the tap, you get you use as much water as you need, and at the end of the month, you're going to kind of do your use to your usage. That's what they're hoping to do. Um, and that brought along a lot of benefits um, in the sense that you don't need to do enough cost investment anymore companies that they do now, they provision for the peak. For instance, uh, Facebook provisions so much memory and so much hardware in case there was a peak, they would be able to handle that load. And without and with not computing, they no longer need to do that. They just basically use as much as they need and increase and increase their usage based on their demand. Um, and, and there's no lot of ambiguity about cloud computing. And the reason for that is that the concept is not really a new one. Cloud computing is not a new technology. It's a new way to offer what you already have. Um, and to, there was actually a journal that compared 20 different definitions of cloud computing um, because there's so many of them. And um, to like uh, the United State, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology provided the following definition. So cloud computing is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of computable computing resources that can be rapidly provisioned and released to the minimal management effort or service provider interaction. And that pool of configurable computing resources is what you refer to as a data center. So the data center network is that physical hardware that we offer to the clients. So the client's application will be running on part of this hardware. They increase their demand if they need to, and they decrease their utility, and they're full of data. Um, now, although the concept of cloud computing is not really a new one, it has only became possible to make this advancement that we see, mainly in terms of advancements in processing and storage technologies, the availability of cloud services, and that allowed us to create mega data centers that are built at remote locations, because when you build mega data centers in Alaska, it's, cheap, it's cheaper to build them, right? It's really cool things. And then, and then one of the key enablers of cloud is the concept of network virtualization. I know I'm throwing a lot of targets at you, but I'm just trying to define the problem. So when we show how we solve it using cloud we solve it, it kind of makes sense, right? So network virtualization is an easy concept. Basically, before, whenever we have clients running on a data center network, every client will have a dedicated server. So for instance, you have the blue client and the red client and the green client, and everyone would have his or her own dedicated server. What virtualization said is, well, and actually studies have shown that most of the servers are only 20% utilized out of their total capacity. So there's been a lot of research without network virtualization. So what network virtualization allowed is now that it is by adding a virtualization layer, for instance, hypervolumes, you'll be able to collocate your clients together and make best use about out of your network resources. That's the concept of network virtualization. Now, what does that mean? So now that you have, you have your physical network, you have your cloud data center network, and your clients would be running on top of your cloud data center network. And your client would be represented as a virtual network. 
And basically, that's a typical application, a three tire application. And the problem here with the cloud provider, he or she would need to decide where to place that application in their network. You have so many different possibilities. And that's called the virtual network embedding problem, so the virtual network placement problem. Now, we're, we're not there yet, we're not at the problem yet. Let's add another little factor here. That's another type of application right there. But then the only difference that you can see right now is that you have a load balance now be. And a load balance is what we call the request. You have so many different kinds of middle boxes and data center networks. You have load balancers, firewalls, search detection systems, antiviruses, many others. And the problem becomes a bit different in the sense that initially the cloud provider only had to decide where to place the web, the app, and the databases. But now the extra module is actually now you have a load balancer, but that load balancer is a hardware. It's actually already placed. And the role of the cloud provider is now to decide where to place the web, the app, the databases, and how to make sure that the traffic between the app and databases goes through a physical hardware that's already placed in the network. Yep, yeah. so far so good? Okay, we're very close to finding the problem. Okay. So, middle boxes, right? There are unique choice elements in data center network. Actually, there's a study that shows that there's as many middle boxes as there are network and routers in the data center. Um, they, what they do is they enhance the performance and security of Dennis. For instance, Dennis can decide that all the traffic coming to his or her application has to go through a firewall. That's one example. Um, and usually, flows go through a chain of middle boxes. So, for instance, that's an example of a chain. A flow coming to my application has to go through an edge firewall, an intrusion detection system, another segment firewall, then a load balancer, then it reaches the application. So, for, that's an example of a chain. Okay. Now, the problem with this. Although these boxes have a lot of advantages because they enhance the performance and security of applications, they also have a lot of disadvantages. To start with, they want to specialize the hardware. So if you want to um, upgrade the uh, software of your load balance, we have to go buy another load balance. And they're usually vendor specific. So you're not allowed to change them. They're expensive. They have a long time to market. You have to go buy them in the box and place them in the box and configure them in the box as well. Time to market, and the other disadvantage, and I'll illustrate them, which is they're placed on fixed location in the network. So, as you remember, with our little example, you have to really go through the hardware in the box where it is placed. It's not up to the cloud provider to decide. Well, to overcome these disadvantages, there's been a new technology, and I don't know if some of you have heard of it network function virtualization. What that does is it decouples the software from the hardware. So right now we don't have hardware load balancers, we have software load balancers. And we can decide where to place those software load balancers. And that's fine. So they run atop any commodity hardware, they're cheaper. Um, you can instantiate them on the map, you can decide where to place that load balancer or where you fit. They're easily modified and updated, and they have a shorter time to market. So if you remember that example, so for instance, that is an example of a flow request. And a flow request is basically a client has two virtual machines talking to each other, and the flow between these two virtual machines has to go through three middle boxes, the red and the blue and the green. And, and those are already placed, remember, they were hardware in the box before we had that, right? So what happened is, say that the placement of the virtual machines was already set. What the cloud provider had to do was go through the red to satisfy the chain, and then go through the blue, and then go through the green. So in terms of network resources, you are not doing your best thing to do. With virtual network functions, what you can now do is decide where to place them. They're virtualized. They're software-based. So you can actually place them along the path and save a lot of network traffic. Make sense? Okay, so that's the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, it's called the virtual network function assignment problem. Now, those, that, now those, that those uh, middle boxes are softwareized, you can decide where to place them, and the question becomes where, where to place them, right? And how many? And which, how are you going to match the flows to those instances that you place? And why are those concerns a concern to begin with? Is because you have a limited number of instances. Although they are softwareized, you cannot just place as many as you want because they are licensed. So you can place as many as licenses as you have thought. And also you have limited network resources. And you don't want to use your resources to play, placing the firewall for every single client. So, and, and basically, if you look at the network model overview, what you have, you have the physical network, which 
source of raw data center network, right? You have the VNF sites, which are the different build boxes that you can place. And everyone loves it to place. Well, remember, if you have an example of a VNF type as, an, as a firewall, then you have a limited number of instances of that firewall. You have resource demands. If you want to run a firewall on a, on a server, it's going to take up the resources of that server. And, and every firewall has a processing capacity. And you have traffic flows. You have the traffic flows that have to go through a chain of uh, minute boxes. And every flow has bandwidth. So if you kind of forgot, and it's the best bit to ask, right, let's look at this again. So you have the substrate network, right? You have the floor request. You have um, the different types of middle boxes. You can think about the blue being a firewall, the red being a um, uh, intrusion detection system, the green being a um, low balance system. And you want to decide where to place those, such that you satisfy the flow needs. So far, so good? Alright, if I lost you, you can tell me, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. That's our other model. And remember, the problem that we're trying to solve right now is to decide where to place that set of M, such that I can satisfy all the flows that I have. Okay? And, and that's the problem definition. So you have a substrate network, you have a set of flows, every flow has a forwarding policy, the chain that we're talking about. And we want to find the optimal placement of these VNFs, right, the instances that we have, to maximize the number of Indian traffic flows while respecting the capacity and the strength of the substrate. And if you want to, the problem is always the improvements we have here, that's not us, that's an uh, existing problem. And you can think of the problem logically as three steps. You cannot solve this question, it's three steps, but you can think about it as a three step sub problem, which is basically you can first decide where to place those instances. And then you can decide which flow will use which instance. So if you have two load balancers, you can say that flow will use load balancer one, and the other flow will use load balancer two. And this third problem that you can say, okay, now that I've decided where the instances are, and now that I've decided every flow which instance it will use, then I can route the flows through the instances assigned to it. Okay, so that's the logical thinking of that problem. Oh, it's been proven in, in the literature, and I think they proved it through cutting stuff, I'm going to guess, but I'm not 100% sure. But I can, I can show you the reference that I took it from, but it's I didn't prove it myself. You mean that the problem that you try to solve is the same problem that yes, they solve? Yes, but I'm trying to solve it using the next, but I can't solve it. Okay. I'll show you what the existing work has already done. Um, Okay, so I'll show the mathematical formulation of the problem first, then I'll show what the related work has done, and then I'll show what we have done. So the mathematical formation, you have the substrate network, you have the capacity of the substrate network, you have the capacity of the physical links, you have the flows, you have the set of VNFs, you have the processing capacity of every VNF and its resource demand, and you have a massive number of every VNF. Yeah? And the other decision variable, so first we want to decide where to place those and then we're going to decide which flow will use which instance. And then we're going to figure out if that flow is admitted. And then we're going to route the flow series instances and indicate the amount of traffic used. And here, note that the flow is only admitted if the flow is assigned to every single instance in this chain and was successfully routed through that chain. That's how we know that a flow was admitted. So then the mathematical formula. So remember, we can think about it as three sub problems. So if we were to solve the piano placement, the first part, we would assign every flow, we could, we could place an instance on a single server, we cannot exceed the amount of instances we have, and we gotta respect the capacity of the substrate network. Then we solve the second sub problem, which is assigning flows to VNS. So basically, a, a flow could, could be matched a single instance of every VNF type. Like it requires, and also it has to respect the processing capacity, and it has to basically, what was the last one? Yeah, I think it can not, oh, well you don't place more than what you And then the last one was the traffic routing, so we wrap the post for the instance that it requires, and we have the, we measure the traffic and respect the capacity of the software. And then we hope to maximize the number of flows admitted after solving all these three steps. So 
think so can separately. No, we, the model that solves all the problems with that. If you were to solve them separately, you cannot get the outcomes. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, for the flow to DNF assignment, yeah. uh, you assume you have different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, copies of DNFs, but all of them are doing one functionality, like all of them are not. And then you decide to which one these requests should go. Exactly. Exactly. But okay. we have different types of DNFs. So for instance, you would Yeah, but, but the problem that you are solving here, I think, is just for one type of DNF. No, no, really. No, no, I know. It's, it, it can be mapped to different DNFs, but the, the, these, I mean, the problem is only for one DNF. And, and the flow to DNF is summit, yeah. So if a flow requests, let's say, a firewall, then a little faster then I would assign the flow to a single firewall, then to a single local. Okay, so what is, the, uh, what is the policy that we use? Because, for example, in some open source, uh, let's say, projects, like mm -hmm. Open Daylight, uh, they have the same uh, problem and they have solved it. So, for example, they have four different algorithms. One of them is uh, a round robin algorithm. So if you have like 100 load balancers in the network, in a round robin fa fashion, it finds it and assigns one, uh, let's say, firewall or NAT or what, whatever. Yeah. Another algorithm they have is shortest path. So another one, for example, is random assignment. I want to know what, what you wanna, you're going to optimize in this uh, yeah, solution. So precisely, uh, to answer your question, we are aware of existing work. Mm -hmm. We are aware that most existing work were based on heuristic. And when it's a heuristic, they do not guarantee uh, the quality of the solution they provide. So what we solve, we solve the problem to optimality 700 times faster than the IOP. So, so, so your, your metric is time, or it's cost, or... My metric is maximizing the number of flows I can admit. Number of flows. Maximum, optimum, number of flows admitted under the constraints provided. Okay, so it's actually somehow resource optimization problem. Correct. Okay, oh, thank you. Perfect. So, um... Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll briefly explain some of the related work. Um, basically, well, most existing work that we've looked at in their consistent IOP. So again, we're not the first problem people to, to tackle this problem. We, we, all, we look at what exists in the literature and we actually do. So we, we notice that most existing work either consists of IOP and IOP are about to scan. Or, um, so for instance, in our analysis, when we ran the IOP, I just showed you, it took an hour and 25 minutes to run for 35 minutes. And or they consist of heuristics, and heuristics do not provide a guarantee on the quality of the paid solution. So, for instance, one example, one of the existing work, what they do is they say, okay, if I were to route the flow between two points, then let me put these instances along the surface path between those two points. That's one approach, it's a valid one. Um, another, another approach where to solve the placement in the traffic disjunction. So basically, they first place the VNS, and then they route through. But then again, that does not guarantee that we're going to get the best solution. Um, and another approach what they do is that they deal with every flow on its own. So they solve the problem sequentially. But then you're not sure that if you start placing for flow 1, flow 2, flow 3, that when you keep going, you're going to get the optimal solution on it. So what we did is that we solved the VNF assignment problem using the challenge solve. Challenge solve is a uh, optimization technique. It is a decomposition-based method. Um, basically, you would have a master and a sub problem. Master will provide us an upper bound, and the sub problem will provide us a lower bound at every duration. And then, what you do is at every duration, you extract piercing costs from the sub problem. And those costs will be added to the master to, to basically concise the search space at every duration. So, once the upper and the lower bound are converged, we guarantee optimal solution. To further clarify this, um, what we did is Basically, we wanted to decompose the problem to two sub-problems. And what we did, we let the master take care of the DNF placement, the flow to DNF assignment. That's what our master model did. Our pricing will take care of the policy where traffic runs. So basically, at every duration, the master will try to solve the DNF placement in the flow to DNF assignment without any regard to whether or not we'll be able to route to traffic through those instances. For now, we don't really care much about that, but that definitely guarantees an upper bound. And it will try to do that such as maximizing the number of flows that it can wrap. The pricing will try to do the traffic wrapping, and it will try to maximize the amount of traffic wrapping it can do. Okay. So, and then that's our master, that's our sub problem. 
The master will solve that little portion of the problem. It will send that solution to the subproblem. The subproblem will send three signals to the master and we keep iterating until we get well, until both the master and subproblem converge to, to the same solution, which means that we reach optimalities. Um, there, if you want, we could talk more about the different uh, decompositions that we've thought of, and I'll tell you what were the difficulties. And basically, the difficulty with the data design problems is inside of the first because with this approach, we were able to find constructive precincts. Without constructive precincts, it could run It will be as bad as the But we thought about a different way where we had the master to do the routing and the pricing to do the rest. This like the remaining part, the precincts were not straightforward. That's that's all the information. So, um, yeah. so uh, what did you explain a little more personal and why about this? Yeah, I have I have uh, I have more slides to show. So so as soon as this is the search space of the master, okay? What the subproblem will do at every iteration is will give you a cut. Okay? And that cut will take away part of the search space. And that search space is basically telling the master, you don't need to look there, there is not a good solution there. And then at second duration, the master will give another solution to the pricing, and the pricing will add another cut, and will take away another part of the search space. Again, we'll take the, tell the master, don't look there, you're wasting your time. It's their iteration again. So basically, what kind of solve do is that the pricing is trying to guide or give hints to the master as to where to look. Okay. Um, this is how it looks like for us, and I'll explain where the cuts that we add. So basically, again, we run the master, we run the subproblem. And if the objective of the master was bigger than that of the pressing, the subproblem, we would add two cuts. We have two different types of cuts that we add. A separation cut, that's what we call it, and the diversification cut. We'll add those to the master and we keep iterating. Once we reach, uh, once they both have the exact solution, it means we reach optimality. Um, so now I'll explain the cuts that we used here. So remember what the master was supposed to do is to put the flows, a put the VNF instances, and assign flows to VNF instances, right? And assume that it did that for this flow that you have right here, and then send that to the, to the pricing. The pricing tried to route the virtual links, and what we mean by virtual links is every pair, um, every pair of the box that we have in the flow. So it tried to leave the virtual machine, the inverse, the origin, go to the first the box, that's virtual link one. It tried to go from the first middle box to the second middle box, that's virtual link two. Tried to go from the third and the fourth. When that was sent to the person, the person was able to run the first virtual link and the second and the third. But the second and the fourth were not routed. That's what the pricing resulted in. And basically, the, the separation does, tells the master, oh, something didn't work there, change something here. So what the right, what the subproblem will take from this, it will say, oh, Either change the source of the NFP2, because that would have been the problem, or change the destination of the NFP2. Or basically change the source of the NF, the source of the NFP4. Because probably both were placed by the master around bottom end piece. Yeah, that's what the separation about. That's a straightforward one. The tricky one was more the diversification. Uh, diversification got works more on uh, on multiple flows at the what it does is the following. Uh, again, assume that what we have up there is the solution given by the master, which is where the flow of where the instances were placed, right? Um, and this is the physical name. And, and let's try to run the first flow. So right now we are the subproblem, okay? We're trying to run the flows. So we start with the way flow, and we go from N3 to N4. Remember, the master told me where the instances are. And it told me that the first instance is placed on N4. Okay, so I'm trying to go from N3 to N4, that went very well. Then I'm trying to go from N4 to N1, everything is fine. Then I'm trying to go from N1 to N5, and look, we're trying to use for this process. And then from N5 to N6, N3 pretty well. We update the residual capacity of the network, that's what we end up with. We're still in the sub problem, we're trying to route F2. And what I do is do it, we'll go from N3 to N1, that's pretty well. N1 to N4. We cannot do it, but we can go from N4 to N6, right? So what the pricing will tell the master, right? And we'll tell the master, flow two, the second virtual link didn't work, change something there. That was the separation part. Now with the diversification, but what we look at and see is here, 
Oh, so I was able to move from NC to N1, but I did not move any further. I could have left N1 and went to N2 because I have enough capacity, but I could not leave from N5. Right? So this thing is a bottleneck. And, and once I left N1 and reached N2, I couldn't go any further either. And that was another bottleneck. So what the diversification cut is trying to do is figure out where the bottleneck links are inside the network. The separation cut tells me where are the adjacent bottleneck links, but that's about it. The diversification cut tells me where are the intermediate bottleneck links. And basically what we do, we separate the nodes into two sets around the bottleneck links. So we have set one, set two. And the sub-problem of that the master, those are bottleneck links, change the placement around those bottlenecks. So, and then that, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much what we have. Um, if you were curious about the, the, the cut that we have, I should have added that. That's basically what it does. It says that the sum of the traffic that you're trying to send from N1 to N5 must not increase the capacity of the sum of the bottom end things. I recall that we had on every link 10 units. So if you're trying to send traffic from any node to N1 to any node, in the set N2, do not increase 20 overall. That's what the diversification cut does. Because we're doing it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just want to give this question. If we look to the, uh, the NFS, one unit and one placement, uh, but like, for example, I, I'm not sure, like, uh, DNF can be like, uh, you know, by itself, multiple units, and each unit should be based on the physical uh, resources. Yeah. But in your case, you just want one unit and you base it on that. Uh, Correct. Yeah, I, I think if, you, if I'm not mistaken, you're talking about the case where the NFs are, 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 are composed of multiple yeah. units. Yeah, multiple units. Kind of, or multiple units, and yeah. you should sit on uh, yeah. different bases. We did not, yeah, we did not think don't that. consider that. So you need the, the, the VNF as one unit, and this you should replace it. Right? Precisely. And this is the VNF, basically something virtual, it does network functionality for you, right? Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. So we did it as a virtual machine serving a network function. <coughs> That's pretty much how we did it in this yeah. thing. Yeah. But, but it would be very interesting to look at it in terms of multiple functionality functions. Yeah, that sounds almost. complex. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It would be complex and it would be an interesting expansion to the server. Oh, okay. see. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no problem. So, um, is, is it okay? Can I show the numerical analysis? But before, Erika, like, uh, uh, you implement these things. Yeah, you okay. did. Uh, the implementation, yes. not simulation. Yeah, uh, no, uh, not simulation. <coughs> simulation. <laughs> implemented. implemented it, but without a real test bed. It does, it does. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, we did not have a test bed. Simulation. Test. What did you use for simulation? I used uh, basic reconstruct technology with shovel. That's what I used to implement the file solve in the IOP, and I also simulated data center networks. So that's how so I did So that's good. Do you mean like that? Uh, yeah, we didn't go for the, but did you have any how like you look for description of the these VNFs or? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, basically, I don't think I had them in the slide, but basically the way we describe a VNF, we describe it as a virtual network. Right. And um, let me go back to the slide. I don't know if I'll be going too far, too far, but let me check if I because I think I have a question. It's in the network model. Um, this is how I implemented this. So every flow is actually a chain, has a chain. That, that's fine, but this is good, I think. Mean, but mm -hmm. uh, what I mean, like, uh, did you have these things in thought, like, for example, like, uh, DNF, it comes, like, from Vintor, right? Oh, no, no, we also kind of simulated that. So then, every VNF, yeah, and you know, like, there's a standardization yeah. how to describe the VNF. Did you look to these to map it to your walls, or, like, just you made your assumption and then... We, we, yeah, we basically made the assumption of that every VNF has some resource capacity and has some processing capacity. So basically that because because when you place when you place a virtual another function, it, it does consume capacity out of the network, right? It requires some CPU and some memory to run. So we assume that it has um, demands and, and also it has resource demands and it has a processing capacity that full passes through a DNF, it cannot process more than certain capacity that it has. But we I mean the range that we chose was also taken taken from the related grid, so we tried to match what they did in terms of the range that they but we did not really go very 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.